called a linotype because it makes one line of type at a time. <laughs> Try to harken it back to the, those Rube Goldberg contraptions. It is a two-ton contrivance that stands seven foot tall. The absolute pinnacle of late Victorian engineering. Where like the canary pops the balloon. And they're insane. You couldn't explain to them what it is. They say, that's just a big typewriter. And the bowling ball rolls down and scares the cat. Cross between a typewriter and a backhoe and a pop machine. Canary pops the balloon, the balloon cracks the egg, and then I have my breakfast. It's terribly complicated. It was invented by a German watchmaker. It has cams and levers. There's just a lot going on. There's belts and pulleys and uh, everything's flying around in circles. It's things that would totally baffle most modern day mechanics. And yet, strangely enough, it works requires you know the machine and you understand its limitations and you understand that it can kill you. That burned me pretty good, yeah? It is very intimidating. I, I do sort of live in fear of it because it, it can be kind of rattle trap at times. It gets to be your friend or your enemy, depending upon how it's working. It's a fascinating machine, A, and B, it's a complete career dead end. And I tell people that once you get ink and type metal in your blood, it never comes out. It's like a love affair. <laughs> it's one of the most complicated machines I've ever seen, and it's one of the most fun things I've ever been around. The great inventor, uh, Thomas Edison, saw that machine, and he says, uh, hey, this is the eighth wonder of the world. A linotype is a great means of speeding up the production of typesetting. Instead of the old cumbersome method of setting type by hand where you're using one hand to pick out a piece of type at a time and put it into a composing stick, you're instead able to sit at a keyboard, type as fast as you can and as fast as the machine will let you go, and compose type that can then be printed from. You hear about people picking things up by osmosis. I kind of think that's true because this is a case where I watched and observed, and a lot of what I learned about the linotype I learned from my dad. Oh yes, I taught him. Uh, I taught him some of the some of the basics of, of the printing operation, and you can see he has expanded since then. I tend to set maybe a few more mistakes than my dad would, but uh, he has always been willing to proofread for me and correct those mistakes. I can spot a mistake a mile away. I can spot a misspelled word a mile away. It takes a special breed of person to run it. Yeah, I think that I'm that person, just crazy enough to think it's fun and just smart enough to keep it operating. Once the operator is done casting his slugs, casting the page, he will take the slugs over to the proofing area. Here we've got some of the type that we set over on the line of type today. I'm gonna put it in the bed of the proof press. And the slugs will be locked into the bed of the press here and inked and printed to determine if there are any flaws. Lock it into place with some miscellaneous furniture. Hopefully it's a clean proof, so I don't have to go back and reset anything. Any mistakes, any errors would go back to the composer, he'd recast that slug, come back to the proofer, and so on until it was signed off on and ready to go on the press. And when it went to press, it went on to press something like over here. Later on, they learned that if you have multiple editions or multiple presses in major urban centers like New York City or Boston or Chicago, uh, it's kind of a pain to proof uh, multiple lockups of type when you're running four presses, six presses, eight presses at a time. So they would make a cast of an entire form 
and put the identical cast on all of their presses so that way they could meet the circulation demand. And that's how they printed newspapers in volume in the day. Ever since I've been very young, there's been some tendency from my family to, at least my mother, on my mother's side, she wanted to show off her kids. My brother and myself, and we were, we liked to sing and dance around the house, and so we wound up being singers and dancers. When I was nine years old, I was running a little printing press in my own house. For I think my circulation of my newspaper was 20, 20 people, all tenants in the building. <laughs> I spent 35 years working for the New York Times, and uh, that was my, my life. <laughs> And I guess I was just built for that kind of work, as, as the other people were as well. Uh, they didn't think much about it, maybe. It was just a night's nice work to them. But I may be more sensitive, and I could see this was a story every night, the story of our lives, the story of the world's life. The world is make, being made new for tomorrow. What happened today, you'll find out tomorrow. But we're doing it to get you that, to that stage. <laughs> had to have the line to type machine because you had an army of people setting type by hand. Typesetting used to be done this way by everybody. One line of type at a time, one letter at a time. It was slow, it was cumbersome. You have a case in front of you, you take one letter at a time. So the first thing is you've got to find the letter and select it. Then you have to assemble it into a line. Then you have to return all that type back into the case. And that was tedious, slow, hard work. If you have a drawer of type and you're making a book and you run out of lowercase e, <laughs> you got to make more type or you got to break down pages you've already made. So that's what they call being out of sorts. A piece of type is called a sort. Out of sorts, you're screwed. There was money to be made in mechanized typesetting because newspapers had a phenomenal investment in the number of people required to set type by hand. So there had to be some method for mechanization, and that's what they were looking for. And so they began to look at the, the various processes and try and think of ways of, of speeding them up. They tried all kinds of schemes. They, they tried having them a funnel and dropping the letters in, trying to line all kinds of all kinds of ideas, anything they, they could think of. And so from the 1860s to the 1880s, there must have been 50 or 60 different attempts to mechanize typesetting. I'm standing in front of the uh, page compositor, um, a machine that had a very big role in Mark Twain's life. The most famous investor was the American novelist Mark Twain, who invested most of his fortune in the page compositor, which did not work and forced him to go bankrupt. But none of the people who started down the road to invent the mechanized typesetting machine succeeded. The one success came by accident. It all starts because a stenographer wants to transcribe his notes faster. James Ogilvie Clefane was a stenographer. He had worked in Lincoln's cabinet, was the fastest and most accurate stenographer of his day. He's so famous because of the fact that he could get his notes done fast and get them to all the lawyers and to the judge. And the way he did that was to use something called a lithostone a polished stone using lithography where the image is backwards and then you could reproduce as many copies as you wanted. And he saw one brilliant way of using the typewriter. Why don't I take the paper, after I type on it, the ink is still wet, I'll turn it over and I'll rub the ink onto the litho stone. So now it's backwards. What a phenomenal idea. The problem is the ink dries at different levels on the paper. So he has the idea, but the typewriter is not going to do it for him. So he finds an engineer named Charles T. Moore. Moore comes up with an idea for a device with a cylinder, a typewriter keyboard, with a ribbon, and instead of doing a page, it does a line. You cut it apart, and then you rub the ink down onto the lithostone. This machine is not quite doing what Clefane wants, so they go to a machine shop called Holland Company, and there they meet a German immigrant, a new American, named Otmar Mergenthaler.
Mergenthaler helps them develop some of the ideas for this machine, but says it's really not going to work. It's not going to do what you want it to do. He helps them develop another version of it, but it doesn't do it either. He says, no, the only way is you're going to have to find a way of using actual type. Well, Clefane has another brainstorm. He says, when you use the typewriter, it impacts the paper. There's pressure there. Why can't we use this new material called paper mache? They raise money, and they develop a machine which we call the first band machine. And all the letters are on a, a metal band, and they're all sticking out. They're all in relief. You hit the keys, and they line up all the characters in the line. You force the paper mache into it, and then you get an impression. You then put it down, put molten metal into it, and you get a line of type. Okay, great idea doesn't really work. They raise more money, and they develop the second band machine. And this time, all the letters are recessed into the bands. So you line up all the bands, you have one line, you force molten metal in, no more paper mache, you get a line of type out. OK, it works, but every letter is the same width. So the capital M is as wide as a lowercase i. So typographically, it's not very good. So Mergenthaler realizes at that point that every letter has to be an individual unit so it can be whatever width is appropriate for the design of the character. But he has to take the band and cut it into pieces so that every letter is an individual unit. He can move those units around the machine and then assemble them into a line. So they now raise more money. At that point, Mergenthaler creates the blower machine, which uses the individual matrix that moves the matrix around the machine and actually can work. Linotype gave you the mechanization so that one person could do the work of six. It could set type six times faster than a man could, and you didn't have to throw the type back into a type case when you were finished. The hand compositors, the typesetters, when they heard, oh, there's a machine going to come and replace you, they started to worry, I'm sure, because they thought, oh, we're going to be out of a job. But no such thing. Because the linotype was such an effective device, and it replaced all these people, um, within a decade after the linotype, they were up to the same number of people they had with handset type. Because the linotype generated so much need for typesetting for books and magazines and newspapers. The way that this machine transformed information is probably its most significant achievement. If you look at literacy in the United States before the linotype and after the linotype, there's a gigantic jump because now you can set type faster. And because you can set type faster, you can print faster. So you look then at the number of books published in the United States after the linotype. Look at the number of magazines. Look at the number of new newspapers that started. It was important because it made printing that much more affordable to the masses, not just in America, but around the world. Without the linotype machine and the speed that it came up with, you would not have the communication system that you have now. It's really, it's really something to think that just a, a, a machine that makes letters from a, a German immigrant from Baltimore could have such a deep effect on, 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 on people and society. I'm Davin Quincy. I'm 34 years old. I'm a linotype operator. I have people come in to, to see the shop. We have students come in from schools all the time, and they just, they, they're in awe. They have no idea what this thing is or how it works, and I show them how the type is distributed back into the magazines, and it's magic. I like the fact that it's old. I like the fact that it wor the way it works, it's not like a computer that I look at, and I don't understand how the circuit boards are, you know, making stuff do what it does. I'm incredibly happy that I know how it works. It's very impressive to the women. <laughs> the operations necessary to produce a slug or line of type are divided into three groups. Composition of the matrix line, casting of the slug, distribution of the mattresses. The operator, depressing the keys, releases mattresses from the magazine channel. The mattresses are delivered to the assembling elevator in the correct sequence. Here's a close-up of some mats. You can see the letter that has been punched or engraved into which the molten type metal is going to be injected. The line of mattresses is sent to the casting unit. Against the opening of this mold, the mat will fit perfectly. 
the plunger injects the molten type metal into the mold. The slug is ejected into the galley. At the same time, the mattresses are transferred to the second elevator and raised to the distributor. Here, they are returned to their respective channels in the magazine. It's incredible, and it's incredible the thought power that went into figuring out how this machine works. I can't even wrap my head around it reading the manuals, let alone try to figure it out. Strange keyboard, if you don't know anything about the keyboard, has 90 keys on it. It starts out with the most used letter, which is a lowercase e, and it goes e t a o i n s h r d l u c m f w y p v b g k q j x z. So Otmar put all the lowercase letters on one side based on frequency of letter use, all the caps on the other side, and everything else in the middle. So you look at the keyboard, it's E-T-A-O-I-N-S-H-R-D-L-U, Etern Schurdlu. Now the reason that became famous was there's no backspace key or delete key on a linotype. If you made a mistake, when you started typing and you made a mistake, you started in the wrong line or whatever, you couldn't abort easily. So what you would do is run your finger down the first two rows of keys, and then when the slug came out and it said, Eaton Schurdlu, you'd throw it back in the pot, no one would know what was going on. But what would happen, as fate would have it, is that that would wind up in print. And so all through the 20s and 30s and 40s, that was a big joke in the printing industry. Who is Eaton Schurdlu? The linotype machine was important on several aspects. On the most important of all of them is its contribution to journalism, because whether things are looking nice or not, the ability to have a newspaper coming out every day is, is non-negotiable. This is a shrine to the First Amendment, and part of that is the history of news. That's where we are right now. We're in the news gallery at the museum. Right behind me, you'll see things from 19, front pages from 1940 to 1945. We're seeing the all of World War II right here. And every one of these papers was set with a linotype machine by a guy, probably in a very hot room, really squinting to get every single word right. So linotype was able to, to take the words of a few people and make them available for a larger audience because it made newspaper production possible. It's this machine that made it possible for newspapers to print two, sometimes even three editions a day. The newspapers went from eight pages to 48 pages, like almost overnight. The cost of newspapers was driven down. It used to be a dime and a nickel a piece. Pretty soon you saw the New York papers selling for a penny a piece. You can take longer stories, you can take more stories, you can print more often, you can print faster. They had to have content that would attract readers. Therefore, the stories became more salacious, the headlines became larger. If it involved a murder or sex or gambling, it was sure to draw readers in. Even today, with the gossip channel, TMZ.com, Twitter, they gotta know now, the latest joke, the latest have you seen it, the latest web video, viral, or what have you. I mean, it's the instantaneousness of the fact that drives the business. That's the first question people ask me when they find out I'm the public printer. They want to know if I, if I print money, and I say no. And then they say, well, can you get me my passport? And I say no, and then they just move on. We print the uh, congressional uh, record, the Federal Register. We print the Code of Federal Regulations. We've printed every significant historical document uh, in the life of the nation since 1861. So the, our first uh, big historic job was probably the printing of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1862. The stumbling block in terms of efficiency and speed was that we set everything by hand. And when we really turned the equation around from uh, minutes per line to lines per minute, 
uh, our work here just exploded. Well, the Lante Battery GPO, as far as I know, was probably the largest um, in the world. Um, I think there was about 150 in total throughout the building. And it was just something to see all of those machines lined up all the way full length of the building. And the noise was pretty loud. All those machines running at one time, pinging away, um, and men shouting and moving around. And it was almost like a ballet of machinery and men moving around trying to get this thing done because every night the record, you know, had to get out. It's just fascinating how every piece is an integral part of one action leads to another action. And uh, I've just found that that to be interesting as hell. I was uh, a line attack machinist. I repaired them. Worked with a, a head machinist uh, who was a little reluctant on teaching me at first <clears throat> because he noticed I had two fingers gone, so he didn't ever figure I'd be able to do it. He used to go out for lunch every day, and while he was gone for lunch, of course, I had to cover the 11 machines, I'd make sure I took one of them apart. And when he came back, he'd see that I had taken it apart, and he'd hit the roof, but that was okay. He had to put it back together again. In the meantime, I was looking over his shoulder, getting, you know, garnishing all of his knowledge. What, what, what's really nice is when you come across some of the old timers that used to run these machines and stuff. They just, you know, they love it when they see a running machine. They they they'll be out in the in the vestibule there or in the hallway and they'll you hear the click 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 and all of a sudden they they're attracted like mice to cheese. Okay, coming in the door because they hear that sound. If your mouth keeps your hands from working, keep it shut. So that's a pretty good motto. These people that ran them were really irreplaceable. I mean, you just couldn't put anybody down at a machine and say, you do this. It took, you know, it took several years to really become a, a, a decent printer at a Lonotype machine, and really many, many more years to become really a good, a good operator. Linotype compositors were the preeminent laborers of their day. This wasn't just a job. Um, this whole thing in this newspaper age, it was a calling. It was, it was something bigger. They were the artists. They were the people that created this wonderful, beautiful typography that uh, we try and emulate today uh, digitally. The people who operated them were talented, artistic people. Uh, posing as industrial types in, in dirty coveralls, you know. They saved you from making stupid errors, especially those guys in the compositors really saved you from making stupid errors from upstairs. And sometimes the guys in composing would find an error in the story while they were putting it in and say, did you mean to say he was guilty? Because everything in this seems to say he's not guilty. You know, what did the jury say? Was he guilty? Oh, I forgot to put not in, and it went through everybody, and they never caught it. But you know who caught it? The guy down there that, with, the, with the cigar that's putting it in. The goal was pick up your, your paper at, at the door of your house 7 o'clock in the morning. That's the goal. And you wouldn't care how you worked it or how you did it at night or when you, when you went to press. That's your problem. Our problem is we want a paper there in the morning, first thing. You had a deadline on Thursday, and you didn't dare miss that deadline because if you missed that deadline, they couldn't print the paper. And if the paper didn't get printed, it couldn't, it couldn't get in the mail. It get in the mail, the prescribers wouldn't get their paper till late, and they wouldn't like that. So it was a vicious cycle. It was not easy, but it was fun. I was sitting there at my type, my machine, doing some classified advertising, I guess, and along came some people. I could see them from a distance. The foreman of the composing room then came over to me, and he said, Carl, he says, we have some visitors. He brought all the people over, and then there was this woman, and he says, oh, yes, he says, and this is um, Marilyn Monroe. He could have been knocking me out of my chair <laughs> if he wanted to, but I, I took the shock. <laughs> I said, okay, Marilyn Monroe and anybody else 
<clears throat> you still all have to learn something about the machine at once. And I set up a line of type in her name. I said it in boldface, so she had known she would like that. And I gave it to her and I said, this is your name on the beast. And she looked at it and everybody else was looking at it and looking at me, I guess. And she said, thank you very much. And she kissed me on top of my head because I'm sitting down here and she's standing over me. And um, I said to myself, there goes the day. <laughs> That's all they're going to talk about now today is <laughs> my head. <laughs> Memoriam, City of Boston Printing Department, 1897 to 2010. All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the City of Boston Graphics Art Printing Equipment Auction. Today we're going to be auctioning off the assets of the printing department. All right, here we go. Lot 101, the Heidelberg Four Color Perfector. And how much? Let's start off at about uh, $20,000. $20,000 to get it going. $20,000 on bid, and now $22,500. Any interest in the liner type machine? $500 in the liner type? $500 quickly? A couple hundred dollars? Any interest at all? Any interest in the liner type? $100. One, $164, dollars $100. Ten dollars. Ten not twenty. Ten not twenty. Not twenty dollars. Ten and now twenty. Ten not twenty. Not twenty. This accent is killing me. I'm here to attempting to and successfully acquiring a linotype machine for the museum in Waltham. Ten dollars now, twenty? Any, four, ten, twenty? You want them both? You can take both of them, right? Take them both. Take them both. I think I spent ten dollars for a machine. Whether I bought one machine or two machines is a matter of conjecture. This gentleman is from one of the museums. I want you to go visit the equipment. They were sold for the ten bucks to the Museum of Industry and Innovation out in Waltham, Mass. And so they are going to be setting up some sort of demonstration um, to, to show people how liner types work. Thank you very much, I appreciate Thank you very it. Much. Good luck, you'll enjoy Thank these. All right, now, 166. I know what the machine does and I know why it does it. As far as the operation and maintenance, uh, I'm um, very much in the dark on that, but I guess I'm gonna have to learn. Can you get that? Of course, I've got my name and address. I would, uh, I, maybe you shouldn't be photographing that. Do you know anybody who wants a second machine? Offhand, I don't, but hmm. Dave Seed, because he travels the country. Why don't, the... why don't you get the word to him? Because I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I definitely do not want a second machine. They're going to skin me for the first one. You really, really should make a uh, touch base with Dave. Well, let me give you my name, and I'll give you my phone number and my well, email address, uh, and he can get to me any way he cares well, to. Well, I'll be very blunt. Yeah. You're going to have to get to him. I'd say since 95, I've probably worn out four vehicles, and over a million miles, I would say. Uh, Beth and I will get in our vehicle and we'll start in Tennessee and we'll make a whole circuit of the west coast or the east coast and might work on anywhere from 20 to 100 jobs. We want to teach everybody in their own print shop how to take care of their own equipment because there is nobody else that's going to travel like we do. It's good that we both get along with each other fairly well. Otherwise, I'd be hanging outside the window sometime. Basically, we're going up to see a customer at White Star named Tim Trower. And he wants a mouthpiece put on his line of type. I went ahead and dug out screws. Your choice of mouthpieces. Okay. Probably. How, how big a one do you, how big a type do you say? Uh, These are not mouthpiece screws. Oh. Nope, that's F, this is F65, that's mole screws. I don't see any mouthpiece screws in there. Okay. Let's go to the second location. Looking for F2791 is the part number. No, okay, 308 is the gas equivalent. When I look at the parts, sometimes I know the number, sometimes I don't. 
Uh, there's a spring down there on the lift that's a BB-479. The rubber rollers are part number H2601 for the smooth one. The keys are H74, sometimes they go bad. Plunger's an F898. What we're going to replace is this piece right here. It's called the mouthpiece. That's the old used one. This is the brand new one we're going to be putting on. To run the machine, the puppy dog tail needs to be up. Now we're going to partially cycle the machine. We'll stop it right there. The mold slide will come all the way out of the machine. One of the things, if this throat is dirty, you'll get bad slugs. They won't look good. They won't fill up. I've seen him work on a machine on a project that would have me literally cursing and tearing my hair out. And he, he breaks a sweat, and that's about it. This is a throat saw for a linotype. You want to saw on the way out, so you're pulling the dirt out with you. You don't want to push the dirt back in. Yep. Good flow. What I just did was I pushed the plunger down again so that the metal would squirt out all the holes and you could see if you had a good flow to every hole and a good stream. And it looks like we had plenty of stream, plenty of pressure on all holes. So it looks like we're good right here. Squirt number two. Well, what I like about Dave is that he shows you all of his secrets. He is a great teacher. He wants you to learn what he's doing so that the next time you have a problem and he's in England on a service trip or in New England, you can take care of it yourself. I had a romantic notion of letterpress when I was uh, a young fellow and, and uh, began collecting the stuff because I never had much of a budget to work with and the stuff was all free. I studied journalism in, in college and I always wanted to publish my own journal or, or uh, magazine. The Almanac tackles a lot of land issues, environmental things, um, sort of the cultural health of the state. I don't think there's another publication in America on this scale that's done hot metal. Eldon is one of those angels who uh, happened to be around when I was uh, starting out and uh, his career because of the technology, uh, his career as a linotype operator was winding down because there just weren't any left. And he uh, started working for me and he's always worked part time, just he comes out when I need him. there would have been no Wapsipinic and Almanac, at least in its current incarnation without Eldon. One of the reasons that newspapers like to employ deaf people is because they weren't bothered by the noisy working conditions. And yet, strangely enough, even though they couldn't hear the machine, they could sense what was going wrong with the machine and were able to respond to it just about as quickly as a, as a hearing person. Show off. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. 
I asked the guy one time, is there anybody teaching this? And uh, he says, no, not anymore. They used to do it all the way around the world. But uh, um, I said, well, I'd like to start Linotype University One. And uh, pretty good idea. If you read the word that says Linotype University, you're thinking of a campus with uh, <laughs> big buildings or something. Well, yeah, that's not the printing business. This is Linotype University 8 class. Um, this is where people come to the United States, to Denmark, Iowa, to learn how to operate a Linotype. I probably learned more about the machine this week than I ever had in the 15 years or so that I operated the machine. People all over the country, the world, that is interested in it. Like this week, we've got one fellow from Australia and, and then one, one from England. We have a very good range of professional or ex-professional linotype engineers who are very, very generous with our advice and, and help. Uh, linotype University is a unique corner of America, um, run by a guy named Larry Raid. This gentleman that runs this museum here and welcomed me here is Mr. Larry J. Raid. And I've got to say, if we say in Australia, mate, <laughs> good on you, mate. And he, from what I could gather, is just a fanatic for the machine and taught himself how to use it. His two passions are uh, vastly different, um, linotype machines and locomotives. The train, it's a, a Davenport locomotive, an 060 diesel mechanical with a cat V8 engine in. I rebuilt uh, six miles of railroad track with that Ford 8 in, had a little boom on the back. I mean, he bought a train and laid track for it, and I mean, who does that kind of thing? Larry's a collector. It's very hard for him to part with anything, as you can see. Most of the places that have them are museums, and if they have one line of type, they don't need two of them. If they have one printing press, they don't need a third or fourth or fifth one. And I'm not that way. These are a couple linotype, intertype that I'm using for parts. And as we go down, there's another linotype over this way. I've just been a collector and I just keep collecting and keep collecting. And now I've got something over 90 of them all together. What some people don't understand about Larry is his dad owned a junkyard. And so Larry grew up in a junkyard. So having machines sitting outside or rusting or whatever doesn't surprise Larry. Larry, oh yeah, we'll get that running. Oh, we'll fix that. And so it's just sitting there waiting to be restored again. Because to Larry, nothing is ruined. It's all still good. It's, it's metal, it'll, it'll fix. I've also encountered people that sort of belittle the whole program, um, and I can see why. He's not classically trained. He wasn't trained by Linotype to do this. But in his own way, he's a total genius. There's so many people that have called and said, well, Larry Raid says call you, or Larry Raid says this, or Larry says that. And uh, it's because, because Larry's excited, other people get excited too. He's the kind of uh, prophet that I think this uh, sort of thing needs, you know, this, this gospel, if you will, needs as somebody uh, who's passionate and, and maybe a little bit crazy. Um, you need that, I think. Here. Okay, here we have... Um, and I don't know if you can get in on that. It's from the New York Times. It's the last standing times or standing type as times went uh, from hot metal to cold metal type. But I believe this is a page of the obituaries, which is kind of sad, isn't it? In one way, you felt sadness. You had to <clears throat> because you knew it was going to be it was coming eventually, like a dying patient. And they came to work one day, and it was all over. I do not 
printer now for 26 years. I've been in this place for 20 years. Six years apprenticeship, 20 years journeyman. And these are words that aren't just tossed around. All the knowledge I've acquired over these 26 years is all locked up in a little box now called a computer. I had some guys around me, and we poured a couple of glasses out, and he said, to yesterday. So we said goodbye to the past and hello to the future. We had uh, these machines on the back of a big truck, a dump truck, and I stopped at a junkyard, a salvage yard, and I just turned my head and pulled this lever and it, it slid, this machine slid off. And, and I just couldn't even look at it because I knew there was good machines, but nobody was running them anymore, as far as I knew. And the records I made, mean, I just smashed it up with a big 12 pound hammer, and I thought, oh, that's, that, that's the sad part of it all. At the end of, of uh, Linotype's usefulness here, there was no market for the machines. Um, and the only way they could really be gotten rid of was to scrap them. As far as I know, they were all surplused and they were let go, and, I, and unfortunately, they were probably junked. They opened up a, a window at the back of the, of the floor where the largest of the, the Linotype batteries was and just pushed them out into the parking lot pushed them out to be piled up and hauled off for scrap. They're scrapped in two ways. The machines are hauled to the junkyard and melted, and the skill sets and the expertise and the knowledge of the people that ran them is also hauled to the junkyard. All the presses, the linotype, the proof presses, all of that disappeared. All that iron scrap went out in the back and rusted there for this. It's a cathode ray tube phototype setting system called Linotron 505. It produces high quality topography. Machines like the Photon, the very first phototype setting machine. Looks like a combination of a steel case desk, a typewriter, and something from Star Trek. This was the future back in 1985. And uh, as you can see, the future is, is past. Well, this is the end of the tour. And this is kind of the unresolved thread of our tour. This is uh, the computer room, the digital typesetting room. And uh, it's, it's very old. This is from like 1990. Farewell, farewell, and one should lose. Best years of my life I've spent with you. Now our printing days are at an end. You've set your final type, my friend. Computers are the thing that finished you. This is what the Linotype Company looked like in, in Brooklyn. At one time, Two blocks, two square blocks were the factory. One square block was where they made the machines. The other square block was the uh, headquarters and the matrix manufacturing. Um, it's now a storage facility for some moving company. It's very sad. You've got to go. No more hot lead. The type we love to set, that way is dead. Computers and cathode tubes replaced us But by God, they'll not erase us Cause we taught them everything they know If the 90-some machines are gone to the junk man, all my endeavors have gone down the tube after I pass away. So, someday I will. Uh, my wife is probably going to throw the machines in the hole right after me. <laughs> the only way you're going to keep me down. <laughs> Hopefully they'll go on to somebody else that will take them and learn how to use them. Hopefully I'll find somebody that wants to learn the machine and I'll be able to teach them. 
Um, then the best case scenario, if that doesn't happen, is that they go to a museum where they're at least preserved as a static display of what they used to be able to do. Worst case scenario, somebody's gonna come in here, look at them, and go, man, that's worth nine cents a pound. It would cost me maybe four or five thousand dollars to get it operating again. We've offered the machine to a number of museums. Most museums already have a linotype, but they too are just sitting there. They're not doing anything. Most of these machines now are headed for salvage yards, and uh, I wish it were otherwise. <laughs> So we have made the decision uh, to take this to the salvage yard with a few tears. It's, uh, it's not what I really prefer to do. But I want to be here carefully to document the fact that that's the right decision and uh, it's, a, it's not an easy one as we say goodbye to this today. I guess I'm glad not to have to watch it because uh, I know how finely machined this thing is, what, what a fine tool it is. And to see it just destroyed, uh, I, I, my, mind keeps going, my mind keeps going back to the inventor, Otmar Mergenthaler, and uh, that hurts. Well, that's pretty devastating, but it also shows you the durability of the machine. It was uh, emotionally tougher than I expected it to be. Oh, a little twinge of regret, but not really, because, hey, everything's got to make way. And uh, even Otmar Mergenthaler's linotype has to make way. Over the next few decades, without Dave's seat and people like him, these machines will just stand here idly. After a while, because they're doing nothing, they will sell them for scrap metal. Being a young operator and learning this stuff from people that are 80 years old is also feels like a bit of a responsibility, that I should learn as much as I can while I can. If, if it's to survive, if it's to be appreciated, and if it's to endure, I think someone's going to have to pass it on. The machines themselves were put up at auction in Boston. They were purchased by one of our founders and trustees, a man named Howard Gorn, who in turn um, asked if he could donate them to the museum. We expected to only receive one. However, when the uh, riggers left this afternoon, there were two here. We have two linotype machines delivered. They still need to be uh, connected electrically. A lot of electric wiring has to be replaced. And they are going to need some mechanical attention. A lot of the drive belts have to be replaced. And from there on, we'll just see. The accomplishment is seeing them not go to China as, um, as scrap metal. I was looking for a home for the second one. And if we can find a home for the second one, uh, I, I would not feel sorry about finding a good home for it. But I'll be goddamned I'm going to see this thing cut up for scrap. And that's what it boils down to. I think for most commercial purposes, you have to say, yes, it is a dead machine. You can do it all much more quickly in other ways. On the other hand, I think it's, it's not a dead machine in that there are enthusiasts around, and I hope there will continue to be enthusiasts who find them sufficiently interesting. Anything that I get into that's new is going to be obsolete soon, so why not get something that's already obsolete and make the best of it? It's a closed system. It has become what it will now always be, uh, so that there's, though there's a lot to learn, a lot to learn, one lifetime isn't enough, at least the technology stands still for you. Somebody had to say something what the future was like and who was being affected by it. So I said, I'll take the voice of the linotype machine and I'll be the poet. This Atma Mergenthaler chap, the linotype, 
he did unwrap. Quite, created quite an awful flap within the marketplace. Type foundries trembled, then they went under. Printer's jobs were rent asunder. Investor's bellies blew rotunda, and linotype replaced the case. Books and papers multiplied in an ever-growing tide, making wings for thoughts to ride up to outer space. Now linotype has said farewell. Right there. Computer type it did foretell, but it let out one final yell. I've served the human race. <laughs>